You'll notice in your bulletin there is a list. I don't usually give you lists of things in the bulletin, but there is a called an atonement survey. Now, atonement is the word we use when we talk about what the cross does. The ato word atonement is made up of at one meant where we who are sinners become at one with God through the cross of Jesus Christ. And there are several theories about how this works. And one of them is called the ransom theory. You remember we sang that term ransom, paid my debt full and free. And then the replacement theory or the substitution theory and both of those are the most prominent theories of the atonement. Now, you notice you've got seven listed there, seven of them. But we're going to look at only three of them. We're going to look at number two and number, no, number one, number three, and number seven. Now, by the way, you don't have to know how the cross works for it to work for you and for me. You don't really have to have a theory of atonement. And uh, I hope today's sermon is not controversial. I hope there's not anybody here who has a particular attachment to any particular theory of the atonement. But in some churches, I think there would be people who would be quite attached to either number one or number three. Now, we're talking about how the cross works. Why it makes a difference to us that some fella died 2,000 years ago. How did that work to save you and me? Well, let's look at, uh, let's look at that number one. It's called the ransom theory. And we're talking about this because this is Lent. We're moving to the cross. We're going to be there at the foot of the cross on Good Friday. As our Lord is removed and hauled to the grave, we need to know what all of this hurting is all about. I thought about the cross this morning as I was trying to put on my tie with my uh, gout in my left elbow. And I've actually dealt with this pain for several days. I can only sleep on one side in the bed because I can't sleep on my left side. You don't know what a problem that is because I spend my whole night flipping back from right to left and right to left, and I, if I can't flip back to left, I can't sleep as well. Well, anyway, as I was putting on my tie, I thought about that pain this morning, our Lord taking upon himself the pain of the cross. Why did he did that? do that? The ransom theory. It originated in the early church, among the early church fathers. You have it there before you. The folks at home, I'm sorry you don't have this before you, but we're going to be reading it out. This theory claims that Christ offered himself as a ransom to Satan. Satan was allowed to kill Jesus, thus freeing humankind from Satan's grip. Okay? Now the understanding here is that after the fall, everything belonged to Satan, the whole world. And the church used to take this very seriously. Those first people that came to America, they would sanctify the area where their homes were and sanctify their church because everything beyond that, everything out in those dark woods, that belonged to Satan. The world belonged to Satan. It was his because of the fall. Let's talk about the fall for just a minute. Meaning that time when Eve ate the apple or the persimmon or whatever it was. You know, I don't think we're so much as fallen <laughs> as we were pushed. I mean, God sends us into this world deliberately because this is the world he wants us to be in. And it is true here that since what we see is this world, this is the concentration of our lives from the time we 
open our eyes as a baby, we see outward. We no longer see what's going on inside our lives. We can no longer see heaven from which we come. So that's the fall. But God knows what he's sending us into. I believe the world is essentially what God, not the evil. God doesn't want the evil, but he does want us to be here and to have this freedom to grow in this particular situation with all of the problems that we face in this world. God wants us to be here for a certain period of time, and then we go back, and we're supposed to have learned some lessons. But nothing ever gave the world to Satan. The idea that Satan owns everything, and it had to be bought back, is a foolish idea. The idea that God is not in control. God had lost his creation. And he had to make this deal with Satan. Okay, Satan, I'll tell you what I'll do. I'll give you my son. You can kill him. And uh, I'll let you do that if you'll let me have the world back. Now, that doesn't, that doesn't ring right with me. And actually, that's, that's not the most popular form of atonement that's around today. You'll find that in many churches, the one that is most popular is called the substitution theory. That's number three. The substitution satisfaction theory. It comes from Anselm of Canterbury, who lived from 1134 to 1209. And no, I won't make a joke about Keith being the only one here who can remember those days. And the, the substitution theory is this. It says that uh, God is just and holy and demands payment for sin. God hates sin. And somebody has got to die for it. God has got to kill somebody for sin. Because God is so holy and so removed from sin that somebody has to pay. Somebody's got to be punished. God is just and holy and demands payment for sin. But instead, instead of demanding that payment from sinners, God sent his son to take the sinner's place enduring the suffering that we deserve. Okay? That assumes that you and I are so totally evil that we deserve to die on the cross. And we're going to get some idea during Holy Week of what dying on the cross looks like. But it, it ain't a vacation. Actually, nobody deserves the suffering that our Lord endured on the cross. It was the most horrible form of punishment that the humankind has ever conceived. It was even worse than those death chambers for the Jewish people in the Holocaust. It was worse than anything I can think of because it was designed to prolong the suffering, to kill a person, but to kill them slowly so that they endured pain over hours and sometimes even over days. Now, the idea that you and I deserve that is ridiculous. I don't know about you, but I don't deserve it. If you want to claim to be that bad, that's up to you. I'll leave that to you, children. Okay. But I ain't that bad, and you ain't neither. We don't deserve that. And, why, and, and what kind of God do you have who says, well, I'm really upset. I am just mad as a hornet. I've got to kill everything bad. I've got to kill it. I created it. I hate it. I'm going to kill it. Ah, let's see. I hate to kill everybody. Instead of killing all of them, I'll kill my son. 
That, excuse me, I can't wipe my eyes with my left hand. I have to do it that way. Uh, that doesn't sound like my God, okay? Got to kill somebody for sin when actually what God does with sin is to suffer for it himself? No. Neither, neither one of those ever worked for me. But when I was writing my book, which book? <laughs> this book, the book that has been unpublished longer than most of us have lived, because I haven't finished it. I've been working on the last chapter, which is about my communion experience. And for this sermon, I was looking in the chapter on the cross, and I thought, oh, my gosh, what was I thinking when I wrote that? That sounds clumsy. I've got to rewrite that. This is the process that I'm going through, and it's a, it's a, I am going through it, and I am, I am working on it. When I wrote this book, here's the way I started. I started by saying, what if we had no Bible? What if we didn't know anything about God? didn't have any holy books at all. What if the only thing we had was the actual experience of God? The experience of God. What if we read those experiences where people say they have seen God, they've been in contact with God through religious experiences, near-death experiences. What would happen if we just looked at those experiences? What kind of God would we discover? And I very soon discovered that even setting the Bible aside at the first of this, not all the way through it, that the God we meet in experience is the God that we know in Jesus Christ, the personal God who loves us, who intervenes in our life. What I did not expect, I did not expect this, that as I moved through that material, I essentially ran into the cross of Jesus Christ. Not in the Bible, of course, it's in the Bible, but in the experience of God, the reality of the cross, the forgiveness of sins, God's love for us no matter what. And as I worked on that chapter on the cross, I realized that I had come up with, this is going to sound stupid, because these are ancient theories of the atonement, I had come up with a kind of different understanding of what the atonement was all about, okay? Who am I to add to the list of these, uh, uh, these ideas. Well, it was there before me, and it wasn't really new because everything that I said is like under the surface in the scriptures and in, in the story of the prodigal son. But number seven is what I came up with. I came up with saying that the cross is something like an x-ray. It shows us, you know how when you take an x-ray, you can see the bones in your hands or you can, you know, see inside your stomach? It doesn't show you the surface. It shows you what's going on beneath the surface. And what I discovered is that the cross is like that. The cross is like the whole life of Jesus Christ. It reveals what's already there. That saving work on the cross, that had been going on ever since people existed and people needed to be saved. The cross has always been with us. And the cross allows us to see what's going on in the heart of God. That suffering, that bleeding, that dying. That shows us what our sin does to the life of God. That shows the brokenness, our brokenness that he takes upon himself. So I came up with number seven. Let's read it. We are part of the life of God. By the way, here's today's scripture. It comes from the Bible, and Charles Wesley used it in that opening hymn, which is this. In him, we live and move and have our being. We exist within the life of God. Another way of saying that is God has made all things from himself. We are a piece of the life of God. We live within the life of God. Let's go on. We are part of the life of God. 
In him we live and have our being. Acts 17, 28. Because we exist within God, God inevitably and in every moment bears all human sin. God bears our life, carries all of us within himself. I was thinking this morning how funny it is that God knows me even better than I know myself. He not only knows what I'm thinking now, he knows what I'm going to think next. God knows us completely. He has our life within him. To say that someone's been separated from God is saying that somebody is separate from their left toe or, 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 or their heart or another part of them. We are part of the life of God. So God does, in fact, bear our sins. And the cross shows us what our sin does to the life of God. Yet also, as God bears this sin, in every moment, God loves us and forgives us unconditionally. Even as we are in the midst of our sin, Or as Paul says, while we were yet sinners, Christ gave himself for us. Christ upon the cross makes visible within human history God's sacrificial grace at the depth of our existence. It lets us see what's going on in the heart of God. It lets us see our sin and feel God's forgiveness. Because what did Jesus say on the cross about those people who had just driven nails in his hand and nails in his feet and lifted that cross up so that he was now hanging there and only the bones of his hands and his feet was holding him on that device. And this is after he had been nearly beaten to death. And from that cross, you know what he said. Tell me. Father, forgive them. They don't know what they are doing. And there we have it. Complete forgiveness, even for those who drove the nails in his hand. Complete forgiveness for Pontius Pilate, who sent him to the cross. Complete forgiveness for all of those who had shouted, crucify him, crucify him. And when we look at the cross, we see that complete forgiveness. Oh, yes, yes, we will somehow have to accept that forgiveness We will have to accept that relationship which we have with God. But from God's side, there is no anger toward us. There is no vengeance. Listen to him. Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. No one, no one who hurts other people really knows what they're doing if they really knew down deep what was going on and the fact that one day they would have to feel what they're doing to the other, people wouldn't do it. Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. I'm going to read that one more time. We are part of the life of God. In him we live and move and have our being. Because we exist within God, God inevitably and in every moment bears all human sin. Yet also in every moment, God loves and forgives us unconditionally. Christ upon the cross makes visible within history God's sacrificial grace in the depth of our existence. It always has and it always will. How did people in the, how are people in the Old Testament times and, and before that, how were they saved? In the same way we're saved. God is always loving us, always forgiving us. This is eternal. 
The cross is rooted in eternity, okay? Now, I thought it'd be fun after I had come across this other understanding of the atonement. I thought it'd be fun to see what somebody else thought about it. So I took it over to Perkins School of Theology. That's where I went to school. That's our Methodist school over at SMU, where I went to school, where Mary went to school. And I thought, I asked permission, and I put this survey in, uh, in people's boxes. And uh, this was a number of years ago. I, I, I didn't give them an email. I gave them an envelope, all right, to uh, circle the one that they thought made most sense, the professors at Perkins School of Theology, and, and to mail that back to me. Now, that takes a little effort, and I so appreciate the fact that I got responses from, I believe, uh, 11 professors at Perkins. Now, I didn't mention to them that that last one was a new one that I had added. I just gave them this list and told them to choose. Well, one, one woman wrote back to me, and she says she didn't like any of them, that I had failed to include the womanist understanding of atonement. <laughs> now, Mary has been in school of theology since I have. She may know something about what the womanist understanding of the atonement is, but I have no idea. And I don't know how you could have a theory of the atonement that worked for womenists, but not for menists. Okay? That doesn't make any sense to me. So I'm just as glad that I left that one out. And then another professor said he didn't like any of them because I had omitted the Eastern Orthodox understanding of the atonement. But I think that the Irenaeus one, uh, which is there, is actually Eastern Orthodox, so it didn't know. But anyway, that's two of them by the wayside. All of the other 11 professors at Perkins School of Theology chose something they had never seen before, which is number seven, the one that I had written. And why did they choose it? <laughs> because let's be honest. It's the only one that makes any sense. It fits with the whole other gospel. It's what is actually going on on the cross. Our Lord came into this world to reveal God and to reveal God's forgiveness. And Jesus did this with his whole life and all of his teaching. And then when that, that last horrible and painful show and tell, which he said at the Last Supper, I am doing for you. This is my body. This is my blood. This is my body that is broken for you. And then he gave himself to the powers of evil and was hung up on that tree for you and for me. And it is for our sin. It's not to pay a ransom to Satan. It's not in our place, or in a way it is, but we don't deserve the cross. But it's mainly to show us, this is what I've been telling you. I'm going to show you what it's like. This is receiving the sins of the world. At the same time, I am forgiving you. And then I'm going to show you one more thing. I'm going to show you none of it stopped me. I'll be back with you with all of my resurrection power. Now, if you want to take this little thing home, you can do some surgery, okay? And you can simply tear it off of your lilies list. I'm going to talk for just a moment now in case you need to finish your lilies list. 
My sister was a teacher for 40 years, and she still wants to do some teaching. So for the last few months, she's been working on a series of classes, four, five, six, whatever, that will meet during the Sunday school hour after Easter. And uh, she's going to be teaching on near-death experiences. You're going to hear some things that you've never heard before that will lift you and encourage you. And I'll be in there for the discussion times and so on. But my sister will be teaching the class. And there will be another opportunity if you want to sign up for that a little bit later. Now, will the hushers come forward and take the Lily's List from folks who are here? And if you're in the choir, you've made a Lily's List, you give that to me after the service today. And meanwhile, I want you to be thinking just a moment about Holy Week. I would like for everyone here to consider coming to both of our Holy Week services. Both of them. I know it's hard to be in church on a Thursday and a Friday evening. But I think it's important for our Easter. Because the only way for us to get to heaven is through the cross. And those are services. Thursday leads up to the cross and Friday is the cross. And I want you to consider coming to those two services, which I consider two of the most important services of the year. And if you have any friends, thank goodness if you do, uh, invite them to come with you uh, then and on Easter Sunday. We have a glorious, glorious time coming. Glorious time. I am excited about it, and I always am this time of year. We look forward to it. Join me in prayer. Dear gracious Lord, however we see it, we know that the cross works and your forgiveness works, and we are here before you now, and hard is it to believe. We know that we are loved and we are forgiven, and we know that we need to take that next step and say, yes, we trust you. We trust you to do this so that we can forgive ourselves. We are before you now, Lord. You work in our hearts. Find those places where we're still hurting, where we're still afraid, where we still feel so guilty, and minister to those places in our lives, reminding us that you see us as you created us beautiful, and justified through your sacrificial grace. In Jesus' name, amen.